afternoon and welcome to Global Report. I'm your host, Lei, hosting all the way live from Singapore. We have with us today Mr. Bila Hari Kausikan, who is a highly accomplished diplomat. Mr. Kausikan was the permanent sec at the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs and also the permanent rep of Singapore to UN and Singapore's ambassador to Russia. Nowadays, Mr. Kausi Khan is the chairman of the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore. Welcome to the show, Mr. Kausi Khan. Well, thank you for inviting me to your show. Thanks, uh, thanks good for- Good afternoon and good morning to everybody in Hawaii. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's afternoon there. But thanks for coming on. Now, today we're not going to be talking about the Middle East. We're going to have you back on a later show for that. But what I wish to hear from you, which I think will benefit the American viewers too, is your take on small state diplomacy. And let me just quickly explain why this is needed. In my experience, and I lived in US for the larger part of my life, it's, it's inconceivable almost to get people from big countries to see the world through the lens of small countries like Singapore. They don't understand our foreign policy of being friends to everybody, you know, even countries that they don't like. So with your broad experience and diverse undertakings, could you um, share with us what small state diplomacy entails, please? Well, you're absolutely right, first of all. I gave up many, many years ago trying to explain <laughs> how the world looks to, to a small country. It looks, very it looks very fundamentally different to a small country, and whether then to a big country, whether that big country is the United States or China or even a medium-sized country, let's say like Japan or Australia, right? Well, I think, you know, if you are a small country, you have to start from the premise that I am irrelevant to the world. That means your first thought, your basic strategic imperative is how I make myself relevant to the world. And there is no magic formula, there is no silver bullet to this, because what makes you relevant vis-a-vis, -vis, say, the country A, right, may be irrelevant vis-a-vis -vis country B. And what makes you relevant today uh, may be irrelevant next week or, or next month. So it is a constant process, it's a process, it's not an event. You can't say, all right, I'm relevant now forever. Uh, how you do that, of course, is you have to be alert, <laughs> you have to be agile, uh, and you have to have, you have to be uh, aware that however small a country is, it always has some agency. However dire a situation may be, there is always something you can do. Now, whether you have the, the wit to recognize what you can do and the courage to do it, that's another matter. But in principle, there is always something that can be done. Now, Mr. Kalsikan, just to yeah. interrupt you there, you say that a country, a small country has to be agile. But yeah. I know that Singapore has this consistent principle approach when it comes to dealing with foreign players. So do you think that mindset somehow constrain our flexibility and no, our think, ability to adapt? No, I think you have to understand what we mean by being consistent. We are consistent in the pursuit of our national interests. That is the consistency. Uh, our national interest is based on a number of principles. Uh, and that is, shall we say, the, 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 the star by which we navigate. But you can't influence many international events because you're small. So in order to keep that course, you have to keep, you have to cultivate agility, mental as well as um, policy agility. Uh, your national in right now in the context of US China uh, competition, much more intense than normal. You know, your national interest, Singapore's national interest, might sometimes take us, uh, lead us to tilt in the American direction. Sometimes it may lead us to tilt in the Chinese direction. And sometimes it may lead us to disregard both of them and go our own way. Right? That's what I mean. That is the basic consistency. Uh, small countries get into trouble when they try to please one big power or another. Because if you please one, you won't please the other. So you have to please yourself. <laughs> right? When I was um, in the foreign ministry, I used to tell young foreign service officers that we are not put on earth to bring joy to American hearts or to bring joy to Chinese hearts or Australian hearts or Japanese hearts or Indian hearts or European hearts. We are on earth to bring joy to Singapore hearts. And that is the consistency that we must pursue. 
Now you mentioned China. I know one of the constant pressure that we feel from China is that they try to impose this Chinese identity on us because we are the only um, ethnic Chinese majority country outside of mainland China. So, you know, there's this constant pressure from them that we are a Chinese country, but we're not Chinese country. We're Chinese, Malay, Indians, Eurasians. And I don't think there's any interest in any of us to be subsumed into the Chinese dynastic system. So how has Singapore gone about dealing with this pressure from China? Well, we have to keep reminding them over and over again <laughs> that we are not, because I think it is something very deep in the uh, cultural and political DNA in, uh, in China, that if you are majority of your population is of ethnic Chinese origin, you must be a Chinese country. You know, I mean, they may understand it may be otherwise intellectually, but emotionally, they keep coming back to it. And this is true of officials, of normal people, of everybody, right? So you, you have to, um, you know, uh, keep, this is one of the consistencies you must, uh, you must adopt, right? Secondly, I think the fact is from now, from time to time, you have to draw red lines and enforce them. Oh. You know, about three years ago, we had to uh, uh, expel this Chinese professor who had both PRC and American citizenship. And we have had to do that with the US too. We have had to do that with other countries. That we are ourselves, we are not uh, a copy of A or B, right? <laughs> Now you said that we 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 have to sometimes tilt a little to the left and sometimes tilt a little to the right. And I recall yeah. in 2018 that um, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long actually said there will come a day. They may come a day when ASEAN, which is the Association of Southeast yeah. Asian Nations, for for the American viewers' sake, um, you know, ASEAN uh, comprises Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia. Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Vietnam, and, and Brunei. So these 10 member states. And Lee Hsien Long said that there may come a day when ASEAN has to pick a side between US on, uh, or China. Um, he didn't say who we're going to pick. But I think in a recent uh, survey by ICS use of eShock, 53% of the respondents said that they would pick um, United States. But when we break the respondents down into their nationality, a majority from seven out of 10 countries said that they would pick China. So what are your thoughts on that? Is the American losing regional confidence here? I Okay, if you look at that survey, and uh, it's by the Southeast Asian Studies Institute, and an earlier one, and there are a number of other surveys, they have been pretty consistent. The, the precise figures vary from survey to survey, but they've been pretty consistent in two things, right? If you ask respondents, is China important and growing importance? Overwhelming majority will say yes. If you ask uh, respondents, is the US important? A majority will also say yes. But if you ask the respondents, do you trust either US or China? Majority will say not particularly, right? <laughs> so uh, I think that is a limitation of these surveys. I think uh, one of the strongest motivations in Southeast Asia is nationalism and nationalism leads you to one autonomy. So ASEAN will have to navigate very carefully between these two powers, particularly in this uh, period of enhanced uh, competition, which is going to be a prolonged period, irrespective of whoever wins in November, right? Uh, I don't think it is necessary that, um, that we have to choose when Prime Minister Lee San Long said it may come to that, it will come to that if we are clumsy, if we lack agility, uh, and if we uh, fail, <laughs> right? ASEAN as a whole. I don't think that is a preordained situation. I don't think the world is a binary place. In fact, most of most situations are not binary. There may be some issue domains where the choices will be that binary, right? And I don't expect. Um, every 10 members will make the same choice. Uh, let me give you an example. It's a bit hypothetical now, but I think it is a right example. I think one of the, one of the domains where um, people are going to have to make binary choices, but even then it's not so binary, right? Is Huawei and 5G, oh. right? But I don't expect that all 10 countries will make the same choice, right? So as a whole, and even Singapore, we haven't made a simple binary choice either. The two main service providers will not use Huawei, but the third 
can use Huawei if it wants to. Hmm. And I think if you take ASEAN as a whole, I cannot see, although the choice is binary, yeah, because it's been forced on you, right? But you can always find a third way as Singapore did. <laughs> and I think, uh, let's say, 10 countries, and I'm just throwing out numbers as a hypothetical here, maybe six will, will choose Huawei. Because there are advantages to choosing Huawei because it's cheaper for a start. If you are one of the poorer ASEAN countries, uh, you know, cost is going to be a major consideration, yeah. right? But maybe the rest won't. And maybe the rest, some of the rest, or even some of those who choose Huawei, will not necessarily cut themselves off entirely from, from the other service providers. So, you know, it's a question of your wit. You know, can you find, can you create uh, more than binary choices, even in a binary situation? It's up to us. So, Mr. Um, Bilahari, let's say we go beyond the two binary choices and try to engage more broadly. Um, but looking at ASEAN, I mean, I agree that I, I think multipolarity is good for ASEAN, but I just don't think ASEAN has figured out a way to, to capitalize on, on multipolarity. I mean, if you look at ASEAN, it's such a diverse organization, be it in you know, political structure, economic development, even all the primordial stuff like race, language, religion is so different. Um, the only thing they have in common is maybe the weather and a uh, desire for autonomy. So how can we overcome these difficulties in, you know, very complicated decision making on the internal even? Well, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. It's going to be quite difficult, you know. But uh, if you look at what ASEAN has done, right, uh, forums that the ASEAN 10 have created, things like the East Asia Summit, mm -hmm. things like the ASEAN Regional Forum, even the ASEAN Defense Ministers Plus, where you invite your dialogue partners, uh, even the whole structure of dialogue relationships. This is intended, even in a small matter, I'm not saying we have enormous influence, right? But we do have, but we are not without some influence. As I said, everybody has some agency. Now, all these, all these uh, forums, they are intended to promote a kind of multipolar multi balance in Southeast Asia. It's giving all the major powers some legitimate stake in Southeast Asia to get involved in the region. Now, a unipolar Southeast Asia, whether the pole is China or the US, is a disaster because there'll be zero move, zero uh, move, uh, place to maneuver. A bipolar Southeast Asia, there will be slightly more place. But a multipolar Southeast Asia, there will be even more space. Now, whether you have, again, I must stress this, whether you have the wit to take advantage of that space and the agility and the courage to use it, that's another matter. But in principle, it's that. Look, I don't see any country in Southeast Asia shunning a relationship with China or shunning a relationship with the US. But these are not the only countries. They, they, nobody wants an exclusive relationship. Japan will always be there. Indonesia will always be there. Australia will always be there. And at least some European, some members of the European Union uh, will be uh, players in the region. So this is a naturally multipolar region, not just Southeast Asia, but I would guess the what we now call the Indo-Pacific, that huge swath of things from Northeast Asia right down through Southeast Asia, to South Asia, to the to the Persian Gulf. This is a naturally multipolar region. Japan is not going to disappear. India is not going to disappear. Australia, South Korea. And Indonesia is a big country in itself. And so is Vietnam. <laughs> so right. There is the space. Now, talking about broader engagement, I have to ask you this, because you were the uh, former Singapore's ambassador to Russia, and your yeah. father, the highly respected uh, P.S. Raman, was the Singapore's ambassador to Soviet Union. So you yeah. know Russia better than, you know, uh, than most of us. Um, now, in 2016, ASEAN and Russia put together a comprehensive plan of action, and you were part of the ASEAN-Russia eminent person group that put forth areas that ASEAN and Russia could collaborate in. Uh, fast forward two years, 2018, ASEAN and Russia elevated their partnership to one of strategic nature, and President Putin made his inaugural EAS attendance in Singapore. So, you know, my question to you is, there's interest on both ends. And we have this big laundry list that's been created, but what's being done on the ground to walk all that talk and to move all these things beyond symbolism? Is there anything that's being done? Not very much. I must tell you honestly, not very much. Is it the a deliberate, it, are they deliberately not doing anything? No, no, or... I, I can tell you why. I can tell you why. And I've written about this before. 
you know, when I was in the eminent persons group, I came to two conclusions, right? Uh, the Russians had not touched, uh, had not thought very deeply what they wanted to do with ASEAN, and the ASEAN countries had not thought very deeply what they wanted to do with Russia. If you look at the document that came out of the eminent person group, it's a laundry list. It is. It's a laundry, it is. List. Yeah. Uh, it's a laundry list of uh, and different items. Some items are clearly not practical. If I remember correctly, there's one item they want somebody, I mean, it's on the Russian side, wants to build a gas pipeline all the way from, you know, the Siberia and the Russian Far East to Southeast Asia. Now, that's ridiculous. I told why my did they, Why friends, did they write it if it's not practical? Because, I mean, was it just an exercise? No, very simple, very simple. They, uh, uh, and, and I'm not blaming the Russian side in particular because uh, some of my ASEAN colleagues had the same attitude. They were just preparing for the first ASEAN-Russia summit at Sochi. They wanted to have a long and impressive looking list of things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I was, I, I, I struggled against it for a little while and then I couldn't be bothered because I don't, I knew none of this is going to uh, materialize, right? So we're just trying to create a document. No, but I think that said, uh, it is time for both the Russians to think very deeply and in a practical way, what they really want to do in Southeast Asia. And it's time for ASEAN countries to sit down and think equally deeply and in a practical way what we want Russia to do in Southeast Asia and then to get together and see whether there is common ground. I think there will be some common ground, right? Because, but uh, we haven't had that conversation yet. I see. Well, thank you. Now, we have a question that came in from a viewer. It's a bit of a digression, but that's okay. Um, that's okay. The viewer wants to know, do Singaporeans want Trump or Biden to win the November election? You know, uh, American politics is like the weather, you know? There's nothing you can do to influence it, right? So whether it rains or it's, or it's sunny, uh, whether it's a uh, hurricane comes or, or there's a drought, you still have to adapt yourself to it. And that's pretty much the situation we are in. You know, whether it is Trump or Biden, you know, it is a choice for Americans. We have no vote in, in the coming election, but we have to live with the outcome, whatever it is. Now, to add to that, I think that there's this illusion or rather dissolution on the ground that once Trump is gone, a lot of the problems we see today will, will disappear. You know, whether he's gone in four more tweets loaded year or in just a few months, um, I don't believe in it. Do you actually believe that once Trump is gone, a lot of the problems will go away? Well, I, I have to say this, right? Okay. Um, many of the things that Trump has pursued as his foreign policy goals in this area, not all of them, Many of the things are not bad goals. They are actually good goals. And some of the things are even better, are better than what Obama was trying to do, right? Could, could you now, list some of them, please? Okay, I'll, I'll list them, but, but, but where I think it is open to criticism is the, is the um, how would I put it? Is the unconventional way in which policy is made and conveyed. Let me give you an example, right? Uh, the situation in the South China Sea. Uh, the Obama administration started conducting uh, freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. But every time they did one, there was a very open public and almost metaphysical debate between the Department of Defense and the White House under Susan Rice, uh, right? About whether a foreign op was really a foreign op. Uh, mm. you know, it, it was a quasi metaphysical debate. And that of course destroyed the effect of having a foreign op. Now, Obama did, uh, he said he's going to pivot to Asia, and to some degree he did, right? By shifting assets and all that. But he was never very, he was never very comfortable with the reality of great power competition. Right? Now that is a reality, whether you like it or not, uh, part of international relations is great powers compete. In fact, not so great powers compete too, right? And you, you should deal with it. Uh -huh. Now, one of the most foolish things I ever heard any uh, international statesman do, do is when John Kerry said uh, uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea is 19th century behavior in the 21st century. I thought this was extremely stupid. I'm not saying that I approve of what of annexing another country, but why must you believe? Why must you expect that your competitor or your adversary has the same values as you? In fact, that if you think that is the natural order of things, you're going to get ambushed all over the all over the time. Uh, another thing I think that uh, 
Mr. Trump did better is to deal with North Korea. Now, North Korea is never going to give up its nuclear weapons. They're not stupid, right? They're bad, but they're not mad. Uh, and how do you deal with uh, a nuclear weapon state? You deal with it as countries have always done it, by deterrence. I think the deterrence of North Korea did, did erode during the eight years of Obama because he clearly had no stomach for it. Mm -hmm. He did nothing for eight years and called it strategic uh, patience. On the other hand, I think where, uh, where Trump policy in this part of the world falls short is in the area of trade, right? Particularly the TPP, <laughs> not joining of the TPP. Uh, the TPP is actually, if you look at the details, and I don't think anybody in the administration probably looked at the details, it's actually stacked in America's favor. It is not a normal free trade agreement. It is actually setting standards for the next generation of industry, the next generation of business. Now, which is the one country that will benefit most from the next generation of business? It's the United States. Okay, well, it's your decision, you left, right? But I don't think this is a final decision. I'm not expecting the US to come back next week or, or in the next five years or six years, but eventually you will come back. <laughs> now, looking at the, the US elect electorate, um, it, it seems that they are very divided on the, on the inside because on one hand, you know, there is the default DNA to spread their ideology, their powers far and wide. And on the other hand, I think they are tired of this never ending wars. They want to step back, they want to withdraw. Do you see US internally being wedged between a rock and a hard place? And if it is, how can they get out of that conundrum? Well, first of all, I'm not sure there is a conundrum, right? I think Obama and Trump agree that it was a mistake to get entangled in the Middle East, right? And they both have been in their own way trying to disentangle the US from that entanglement. And that's probably a wise thing to do. Now, that's not quite the same thing as saying you're withdrawing, you know? There is this trope that is uh, current in American liberal uh, intellectual circles, shall we say, that America is in retreat. Now this, I just don't see it. If you have an administration that says as a policy goal, I am going to compete and compete robustly with China, how can you be in retreat? And, and that is the but, one thing about China that the two uh, candidates agree on. That's the only thing they agree on is they are both going to get tough on China. Yeah, I think they are going to get tough. That, that will remain, right? That will remain. And I don't think um, you will see any, you may see a change of tone. You may see a more deliberate way of making policy and conveying policy. And that's all to the good, right? But I don't think you're going to see any fundamental shift of direction. There will be strategic competition. And one of the main uh, areas of strategic competition is going to be technology because you have a lot of new legislation in the US. And it's not that this legislation only applies to the Trump administration. It will not apply to some other uh, administration, right? So I think that will, that will continue, all right? Uh, with a bit more deliberation in how the policy is conveyed and how it's made. And, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, I think. I don't see the US is in withdrawing from East Asia or the Indo-Pacific now. Uh, you are, our viewers are in Hawaii. That's now the site of Indo-Pac command. It has always been, and I don't see it never being, right? Mm. And as the, the new name implies, uh, it implies that US has interest in this wide swath of things from the Pacific to the Persian Gulf. And I don't see that changing, right? Now, how you, the, 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 one of the things about America is even when a new administration pursues the same policy, it feels obliged to say it's a new policy. Okay, I've got used to that, but you know, okay. look at the substance. There has been a very basic continuity uh, in American policy say, since 1969. The big disruption in American policy in this world is the so-called Nixon Doctrine or Guam Doctrine which says that I am not going to get involved on the mainland of Southeast Asia again. I am going to be the offshore balancer. Mm. And that has been the American posture, whether you call it a pivot to Asia, whether you call it the Indo-Pacific, it's been the American posture since 1969. So it sounds like whether it's going to be Trump or whether it's going to be Biden, there's going to be a rivalry, our strategic competition against China. And this rivalry is likely just going to intensify. So how can we as a small state 
Singapore as a small state navigate this dispute? First of all, have a clear idea of your own national interests, right? And that is your, as I said at the beginning, your guiding star. Then be alert, be agile, and be courageous. Because sometimes you're going to have, I said, sometimes you will tilt this way, sometimes you're going to tilt that way, and sometimes you're going to tell both great powers, I'm going my own way, hmm. right? Uh, and we have done it before, <laughs> and we can do it again. There's no reason why we have not, cannot do it again. Uh, wow. Don't forget, don't forget, there's one last point let me make. We tend to think of the last 25 years when there was basically no alternative to the American-led world order as the natural order of things, right? It is not the natural order of things. For much longer, the international order has been divided and contested. It was so during the Cold War, for example, no. right? And it is now perhaps returning to a more natural order of things. And it's complicated for everybody. It's complicated for China. No, when Mr. Xi Jinping uh, praises globalization and says he supports globalization, he's expressing a deep concern because China was the main beneficiary of American-led globalization. And if America is no longer prepared to give it the same degree of support, China may be the greatest loser too. Yeah, I, I don't think they, they are too eager to dismantle the current order because they're the, like you said, they're the uh, main beneficiary. Now, just one minute to close. Let me squeeze in one more question. You mentioned the Cold War. I know things were very different back then. Things were binary, it's one or the other. But I think these days, if, if America were to go around telling everybody to stop trading with China, nobody's going to listen to them. Uh, nevertheless, is there any lesson from the Cold War that we can extract? and apply to our present efforts at navigating this dispute between US and China? Yeah, I think there's one big lesson. We did it then, there's no reason we can't do it now. We survived okay. something more dangerous, we can survive this and prosper. <laughs> we prosper then, we can prosper now. Awesome. Well, on that positive note, I want to thank you for your time today, Mr. Bilahari, and look forward okay. to having you back on another show. Thank you All so right. much, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.